It's a new Fragments of Silicon generation, and it's not as bad as you might have heard. Welcome to a new installment of Fragments of Silicon. I'm your host, Adam, joining me as always as the regular crew. Um, so let's get to the news on this pre-Thanksgiving edition of the show. Uh, let's see. Galix, why didn't you go first? Uh, well, uh, the new Pokemon games came out, you might have heard. Uh, that's what I've mostly been playing, uh, although it took me a couple of days before I had the actual time to... Uh, really dig into that. Um, the weather's been frustratingly damp, but we've had negligible amounts of snow, so that's good. I mean, it all, it's all been, like, melted in a day or so whenever it's snowed, which I think it's done, like, twice. Um, uh, I need to actually... I don't think we have any big plans for Thanksgiving, but I suppose I should check. We're probably not going anywhere, but I don't know if anyone's coming. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I just, otherwise it's just kind of an in-between week. Okay. Um, let me see. Petty fan, why don't you go? Um, this week's been very, fairly quiet on my end. Um, as far as gaming goes, I'm now renting Hyrule Warriors Legends for the 3DS. And so far, it's all right. Yeah, that was... The first two versions of that game had a rough time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Switch version is performs much better. Yeah, I wish I had a Switch. <laughs> it's literally called the Definitive Edition. Indeed. Well, the 3DS version has trouble with spawning enough grunts, and it had to make some of the difficulties easier because mm -hmm. uh, you get ranked on how many things you kill. Look, yeah. let's just admit the facts. The 3DS should not have gotten Hyrule Warriors. Mm. I mean, the additions it made to it are good. It's just, yeah, it has serious performance issues. Mm -hmm. and, it's uh, not unplayable. It's just nowhere near as good. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. I also decided to say screw it and pay the dollar for three months of Xbox Game Pass. <clears throat> so that's <laughs> that's a thing. Oh, God. Yeah. Stadia, so, but we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> At least I didn't waste my money on that, but anyway. Um, yep. <laughs> as far as things coming up, this Sunday might be really busy. Because we may be looking at doing our Thanksgiving thing then, because that's when both my parents are off. And we may also be getting new cell phones. Huh. Uh, you going to be good for the doing the review session? Uh, hopefully. That's not confidence inducing. Uh, I won't know till Sunday what we're doing. Fair enough. I suppose mm. if worse comes to worse, we can do it on Monday. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Obligations still need to be done on that end. Right. So I guess next victim. <laughs> well, that'd be uh, Twilight, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, not really anything noteworthy this week. Um, um, the work has been busy, of course. It, people um, rushing in to get their Thanksgiving stuff and whatnot. And... Um, in terms of plans, uh, we're expecting my cousin to come in um, this year. Um, and that'll be fun. Um, uh, let's see what else. Uh, uh, besides that, in terms of gaming, um, just been playing the game for this uh, review, and that's about it. Okay. Well, I guess it's my go. Um, things have actually been pretty busy, uh, mainly due to the fact that I had to take my mother to the dermatologist today because she, she's currently recovering some, from some bad knees. Um, 
she fell on some concrete a few weeks ago. So for long term mm. stuff, I've had to do the driving, you know, which hasn't been too much, thankfully. But yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, she's recovering just fine. It's just inconvenient at points. Uh, anyway, outside of that, uh, had the place resprayed or um, re you know, th they also use like a liquid solution. And, and you know, point is, um, the place has been re jiggered for roach infestations. Um, apparently, it's going to take two weeks to, for that to fully take care of itself. Like, and finally, you know, I seem to have really bad luck with Xbox One controllers because another one has broken or maybe has broken because it doesn't seem to be able to hold a charge, but I'm not exactly sure if that's the battery or if that's actually the controller. Or could be like, the cable as well. There's no cable. It's an Xbox One mm -hmm. wireless. Well, I know, but then don't they have plug in with USB micro? I don't know where my uh, one of those is. Mm. It's like it's mm. it's somewhere. I just don't know where. Mm. I'm like, but point of order is getting a new one next month. You know, if only just to have another one, even if the con uh, the other controller isn't broken. I mean, right now I'm using my wired xbox 360 controller which is if nothing else reliable but dear god do i fucking hate this d-pad <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like oh yeah this this d-pad was spawned from the annals of hell <laughs> like, i mean you're not wrong yes and yeah i think that will about do it for the uh for the uh news portion of the broadcast, and that means we shall merrily roll along to the interview uh, of the broadcast. And joining us this week are the duo of Nate and Anne, Annie, sorry, of who comprise World Walker Games. Hi. Yes. Hello. Hi. Great to be here. Uh, indeed, it's good to have you. Right, so how we like to get started with things is we like to get to know the people behind the game, studio, and whatever. And we do that by first asking, what both got you interested in, in video games on a personal and a professional level? Uh, yeah, I've been playing since I was very small. I uh, started off with Zelda 1 on the NES and... Uh, Kind of went up from there, played a lot of CRPGs, um, Might and Magic 2, 3, World of Zine, Wizardry 7, that sort of thing. Uh, always wanted to make games since I was about eight or nine. Um, ended up getting a college degree in mechanical engineering, weirdly enough, but then I ended up back in the game industry um, and uh, kind of took it from there. My, my last game industry job, um, after bouncing around in casual games for a while, was at... Um, Riot Games, and I was there for three and a half years, and that's where we got the money to uh, take on our own indie project. But um, definitely making making my own game is something that I've been going after my whole life. <laughs> I have um, kind of the opposite story, actually. I grew up in one of those households that did not have video games. So whenever people always <laughs> try to bring back nostalgic games and, and tell me about references to things. I'm, I'm always the one just giving this, this blank stare and the smile going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, it's very sad really. <laughs> um, but I have been drawing and painting since I was very young. And after I graduated from art school, I was not sure what I was going to do. And the first job offer that I got was at a small casual game startup that Nate was working at, which is how we met. And um, after that, I think I just kind of just kind of funneled into the game industry through more kind of casual avenues. I worked on some IPs that did stuff with like Nickelodeon and Pixar and that kind of stuff for a while. Um, so I've come at it from less of a 
less of a, I grew up playing games and more of a, I grew up drawing art and I wanted to figure out where that, where that was going to live. <laughs> What's it's a question of what I was going to be drawing. And I've, I've really ended up liking it here. Nate's introduced me to a lot of different games. And so even though I'm, I'm not a native to this land, I'm a foreigner, but, <laughs> but I like it here very much. Oh. Where do you hail from? Oh, oh no! I mean, just the world of video games. Oh, okay. From Ohio. Well, that's not exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, I suppose the question that beckons is, what prompted you to found World Walker Games? You know, what, what desire was it to make your own indie project? Yeah. So. We were like at your parents' house for Thanksgiving or something. Yeah. And your brothers were around. Yeah, we wanted to do a game jam just like between us because we had always kind of talked about stuff like that. And we tried out one idea and that was kind of fun, um, but it didn't end up going anywhere. We were playing a lot of uh, XCOM at the time and then this other board game called Descent Journeys in the Dark. Um, and we just kind of got started talking about like a fantasy version of XCOM that would focus on the characters and like what the characters would, yeah, you know, their stories, not just the mechanics of the game, but but crafting the stories of the heroes that you play in it was something we wanted to try to tackle. Uh, I really wanted to learn 3D graphics uh, at the time because I had been working in um, action script professionally. Um, so it was a good side project. Um, it wasn't very serious at first. It was just kind of exploring a bunch of different ideas. Andy would draw 2D stuff. We would put it into a 3D space. My brother Doug would write some funny little stories. Um, and then just kind of like bumbled along for, I don't know. It was part-time for a few years. Yeah, yeah. And then... Um, Nights and weekends kind of a thing. And then we had uh, we got the opportunity basically to take it full time when when the stock came in. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to give it a shot. Yeah, because I remember you coming in and telling me so the day after when we were going <laughs> to make this decision. You're like, okay, I could go. You'd left Riot, and he said, well, I could go look for another job. But honestly, what I would be doing is just building up money so that I can make an indie game. And if if we have enough to try it right now, let's let's go ahead and do it. And I'm I'm glad we started back then because it took a lot longer <laughs> than we thought it was going to. Oh my god! We thought it was going to take maybe a year, two years at most. Oh and my it's god! We're coming up on yeah. If you count the part time, it's, it's like, almost seven. Oh my gosh! Years, yeah. Yeah, it's a long time. Yes, it is. It's also not an uncommon story on this program. Like, yeah. It's like, you know, games are hard to make. Yeah. <laughs> it's surprisingly difficult. Um, yeah, it's like there were several times when we had something that we thought was pretty good, and then we'd show mm -hmm. it to people, and they'd be like, "They couldn't use it. They didn't understand it." Right. And it was just back to the drawing board again and again um, on stuff that we thought was fairly settled. But um, mm -hmm. finally, got it to a place where we're feeling good about it. Mm. Well, that's good to hear. Um, and indeed. Uh, the game in question is called Wildermyth, um, a myth-making tactical RPG. Now, you've mentioned some of the inspiration in making this is you wanted to make, a, you know, an XCOM-style game with a story. Um, exactly what do you mean by, you know, a, a story? Yeah, well, so not exactly one story, but more like... Um... All the possible story <laughs> procedurally generated. Um, we stories. do a lot of procedurally generated narrative. I'm um, I was playing a lot of uh, Dwarf Fortress and obviously Dungeons and Dragons, just growing up and you know marinating in that. And we wanted that sort of feeling um, where anything could happen. And the thing that's really cool about games like Dwarf Fortress or RimWorld with procedural narrative is that. Um, Feel that you feel a ton of ownership over your characters. You really get to know them and care about them, and the different things that happen to them, like um, become your stories as a player, right? Like you carry those stories and you tell them to your friends. Um, so we wanted that 
kind of, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> How, what does that mean by telling, telling stories? Yeah. So we have in our, in our game, we have a loose overarching goal. And like lately we've, we've strengthened that to, to, so that there is a strong, like, you know, chapter More structure, there's a, there's a basic plot, but what happens in between those plot points is all sort of driven by the procedural system. And so it's all, it's all character driven. Like you might you get a bunch of different scenes basically. And each scene you get is based on the personalities or the histories of the heroes in the party that you have at that battle. So you might, you might have two lovers there and they might have a scene together or like you might have a coward and their rival. And so that might bring up a different, you know, one of the stories that we wrote. Yeah, the quintessential uh, story in Wilderness is you, you're you out exploring the wilderness and you come upon this wolf shrine. And if you play to it, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you pray to it, you're, uh, you're transformed and you get a wolf head. And you're, if you lose any other limbs in the course of combat, they regrow, regrow as wolf limbs. So we have a lot of transformations in our game that um, take advantage of all the work that Annie did on the rig and like making it very flexible, but so that we can swap body parts in and out and really like visually develop these unique iconic heroes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It'll make a lot more sense if you watch a video on YouTube or something. Right. And I will note that um, the storybook. Uh, you know the 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 whole story um, aesthetic, let's call it, um, is indeed in the art as well. Like um, the Wilder myth is presented as a storybook. Uh, like the, <laughs> the difficulty options are <laughs> authors, like fantasy <laughs> authors, which was a nice yeah. touch. Like um, you know. And I suppose my question about this is, uh, you know, was this a conscious choice or is that just a byproduct of developing such a narrative centric game? Oh, yeah. So uh, our like philosophy as a studio, well, it started off as a side project. So first of all, we weren't going to do anything that we didn't want to do. And you're a 2D artist. And I wanted to do some, you know, procedural generation and learn 3D graphics. So like the art was going to be 2D. Mm -hmm. No question. We don't have any 3D modelers or animators on the team. Neither of us are interested in doing that. So we thought long and hard about what we could possibly get away with with 2D. And the thing that stuck out to us and like we kept coming back to was this sort of board game paper craft feeling, almost a little bit like Paper Mario, or but I think of it more like if you're playing Hero Quest or like an old, um, like a tabletop where you have paper cutouts and you're kind of clomping them around the board. Um, yeah. That's really the feeling we're going for with the art. And we started leaning into that and the, the whole visual look, I think, kind of came together around that. Right. Metaphor. Yeah, it started off as just Annie draw something in your normal style and we would stick it in a 3D environment. And it always, it always looked a little off. It looked looked a little apologetic for itself like 2d thing what are you doing in there yeah until we started until we it. really started owning it yeah, yeah pushing like the shadows and kind of the grabbing some photoshop brushes to give everything kind of a paper texture and just the different types of shading that we would do and stuff mm. and that i think it was interesting because the i feel like the writing and the art and the music all informed each other a lot at right. the beginning our composer Candy would do a conceptual piece that had this sort of melancholy, ponderous, yeah. melancholy sort of folktale uh, feel to it. And so I would draw a piece of concept art based on that. And then maybe our writer Doug would see that and that would inspire him to write a scene about what happens when heroes maybe reach this place or something like that. So this this cycle would would go around and around and around. And I think it's slowly, yeah, we honed in on, on that, yeah, kind of real yeah, style and tone, yeah. Quite it makes sense style. to me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, um, let's see. Now, in terms of story, you've made a big deal about, you know, a lot of this is procedurally generated. Um, are there any parts that aren't, that, um, you know, are actually handcrafted? 
Oh, well, definitely, like, all of the stories are written by a writer, but when we say procedurally generated, we mean the whole sort of experiences. So we have a huge bank of events. Well, huge. We have a large bank of events. And um, at any given point in the game, when you're going to face a battle, the game will look at all of the possible events that could happen. Um, and then depending on who's in your party, only some, and like where you are and their relationships, only you're fighting. who you're fighting, only some of those events will be valid. From those events, it'll pick randomly and play one of them. And then further, depending on exa the exact personalities and relationships in your party, um, so like people will take the right roles and then they will flavor those roles further with their own personalities. Now, all that's all written by the writers. So it is handcrafted in that sense. Mm -hmm. But the overall effect is that your characters are consistent. There's no one pre-written sequence of events that you go through. And um, the game plays out differently every time. And individual events play out differently every time. So it's, yeah, it's a little complicated to explain, but that's, that's how it works. I think I get what you're saying. Um... It's like all of the like the actual dialogue is written. It's just oh together, yeah, you know, in a random sort of uh, driven sense. Yeah. So yeah, you know, one you, hero might say what the monsters you, are coming, and then you've got three different lines that could could, that could be that. the response to that. Mm. And, Depending on if you're bookish or coward or hothead. or hothead, you'll say something different in response. So those, like, that's all built into every story, basically, that, that sort of variation. Right, right. It means that every event requires four times as much writing as you think yeah. it does. <laughs> well, I suppose, and I suppose that bleeds into a point you brought up earlier, and that's the development time of Wildermyth. You know, you were shooting for two years, eight, <laughs> seven. You know, uh, and the question is, is that why it took so long, or is it just, you know, the overall development of the game? Well, I think there were a couple points where we really um, made decisions to bite off more and to sort of increase our scope. One of the big ones was when we moved from standard just blocks of text for events to this comic style that we have now. That that was a big change. Um, that was tough and that added a lot of time. Um, but we're really happy with that turned out because the comics are really expressive and we can really- You don't have to worry about walls of text. You don't have to worry about walls of text and we can really p quickly put together, um, at least I think relative to other game mm -hmm. systems or animation systems, we can really qu quickly put together um, stories that we think are fairly high quality. Um, so that was, mm -hmm. that was a big one that extended development time. There was a, a point where we completely redid our overland map um, from a sort of open space to a more tile-based map that was made it much more gamey. Um, that was a tough decision too. And then we had to go iterate on the look and feel of all that. Um, I think the main reason that we took so long is because we could. We kept our budget really low and we kept our team really small. And so with you know low costs, we can just kind of go along and work on what we want to work on. Um, but we eventually started getting sick of it, so we had to ship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose that'll happen if you've been working on a project continuously for seven years. It's not even that we're sick of it. Like, I'll keep going. I'll keep going on this forever. It's just that <laughs> being in that limbo of well, being yeah. unreleased After was, Having to explain to your family <laughs> what you're doing so, with your life. So, when you guys release my game. Yeah. yeah. Soon. Definitely sick of that. Soon, Uncle Mike. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine, Mike. Uh, but let's see. Uh, I suppose switching gears here, uh, we should talk about the mechanics and the gameplay of uh, Wildermyth. As you've mentioned, it's a XCOM tactical strategy game. Um, I've played about an hour of it, and it seems, you know, fairly within well worn within the genre. Um, and my first question here is, how deep, quote unquote? Is are, are the mechanics like um, you know? Is it going to be a very 
convoluted, do you have to pay attention to a thousand stats kind of deal? Or, you know, is it streamlined? I would say it's more on the streamlined side because our focus is more on unique characters, uh, unique iconic heroes. Um, but that said, we have some players who are playing on our hardest difficulty and who are making mods to increase the difficulty level and, like, who have put in a ton of time to the game and, and seem to be enjoying it. Um, at least they, they keep they, us honest. <laughs> yeah, they, they tell they us. Will, so. Yeah, there are balance issues. They will find them. Um, so I really appreciate that. Yeah, we've had a lot of great feedback uh, at the higher difficulty levels, and we're working on some of those issues to make sure that it, um, it scales well. We have five monster groups. They all play differently. Um, we have three three classes that each have about a dozen abilities plus another dozen common abilities. We have about a dozen transformations that can each change your hero in a lot of different ways. One of our new abilities. One of our core um, mechan combat mechanics is interfusion. So the mystics in the game, instead of just casting fireballs, they um, sort of interfuse or sort of mix their soul with a piece of scenery that's out on the map and then they can do different effects based on the type of scenery that is so if it's a it's made of wood they can explode shards of it which will shred armor if it's made of stone there's different effect if it's fire they can you know pull the fire along and do fire do magic damage um so there's a big variety of stuff that that works that way so i would say it's like there's there's definitely some complexity and some depth there. Uh, it's not the crunchiest game ever, but um, yeah, and hopefully it's, not, it's, it's, it's different simple. every time because you're you as your heroes um, advance every time they they level up. You sort of you get a random selection of three abilities from this sort of deck, and that's going to be different every time you play. And so. Right. So everybody your, has their favorite your heroes, way to build their hero, but you don't necessarily get to do it every time. Your heroes so advance differently, and then the monsters mm -hmm. advance differently, too, based on right. calamities. So the monsters, sometimes a particular monster will get more armor or more damage, and other times that, you know, you'll be facing different monsters or different combination of calamities, even within the same monster group. So, yeah, I don't know. We think it stays fresh. Hmm. And I suppose my next question is, how long is a average play session? You know, um, how long, you know, excluding like death, you know, uh, how long would it take to complete a campaign in Wilderness? A campaign, probably, I would say between three and six hours, depending on how quickly you read, yeah. <laughs> um, basically. Um, um, so, and then... That's, that'll be a single campaign, and then we'll have, at our 1.0 launch, we'll have five campaigns, one for each monster group, and then some. there's additional um, procedural campaigns on top of that. Right now, we have two uh, ready. We have the Gorgons and the Morthagi, which are sort of clockwork undead uh, okay. characters. So I'd say there's a solid, yeah, like 10 to 12 hours just in the authored campaigns right now, and definitely more to come. Mm. That's about what I expected in terms of structure, because, you know, a lot of tactical strategy games, they are long, very, very long, like yeah. <laughs> 40, 60, 80, you know, even more hours. So it is re a bit refreshing to see one that's, you know, shorter, but has replay value, I'd say. Like, yeah. and indeed, this game is now out on in early access. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you've touched upon some of the stuff that um, you intend to include. Um, and indeed, my, uh, the next question is, uh, you know, how much more stuff do you intend on adding? And, you know, how long is the early access period before you reach that 1.0 release? Yeah, we think it's at least six months. So, like I said, we're going we're gonna to finish off uh, stories for each of the monster groups. We'll do Steam achievements. We will look at doing uh, controller support and translations, possibly. Um, we have a lot of text. It's a big problem. We have a lot of text, so that's a, that's a hurdle. Uh, and there's, a, there's also some... Um, modding and steam workshop features that we want to make sure we're supporting because we're pretty excited about the potential for that um 
that's all the stuff that we that we know for sure we want to do aside from that just more content um more procedural content um definitely and that's likely uh that's our 1.0 target and then after that it's really just about how well we're doing and if we can keep going we definitely will um we could do it's the kind of game that can hold a pretty much endless amount of content um so we can keep going with dlc or whatever after 1.0 uh, if it's if it's justified, so we're pretty excited about that. Right, and, and indeed, um, do you have a timeline for all of these additions, or is that still up in the air? Gosh, we just la launched early access last week, and we're still reeling. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm not going to promise any dates. We've um, got our giant list <laughs> of feedback and the next feedback items. Yeah, we have a huge list of feedback, and um, you know, a bunch of bugs that we've been going through. The, the, also, the next two campaigns have been written, so it's pretty much down to integration on those. And then the fifth campaign still has to be written, but I'm, you know, I'm sure that'll go reasonably well. It's more, more just like um, balancing that with the other feedback that we're getting from early access, which has been really exciting. Mm. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so I guess the game has been testing well with those who have purchased it so far? We are so. so happy. We have, um, as of right now, we have about 200 reviews on Steam. And the last time I checked, they were 100% positive, which is bonkers. <laughs> for what that's worth. Um, I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess, wait, hang on. So we're really happy about yeah. that. Um, we have a bunch of players on Discord um, we've been sort of talking to and working with. And, um, yeah, we've been really thrilled at the at the feedback so far hmm. and uh in terms of platforms is this game available on all three computer formats you know mac windows and linux or just windows only yes uh mac windows linux hmm. All right, um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to see if they have any additional questions at this point in time. Um, I was actually wondering if you complete a campaign, will it have like all the comic book things laid out so you can like read through it? Oh, uh, that's a cool idea. Um, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a neat idea. I don't, um, we can look into that. All right. Ways to export comics. Yeah, ways to export comics. That's mm -hmm. something that, yeah, it kind of comes up from time to time or just hasn't been a priority yet, but maybe it will be. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Um, anything else, Petty? Uh, I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, Galix? Uh, nothing particular. Okay. Looking forward to see where you go with it. And Twilight? I'm good, but the game looks neat. Thank okay. you. <laughs> well, let's see. I think I'll ask, end things by asking, um, the game is currently on Steam and itch.io, correct? That's right. Um, any plans to launch on, say, GOG? Yeah, we will. When we're, um, when we're closer to a 1.0 release, we'll be looking at other storefronts for sure. Okay, fair enough. And, well, I suppose another question is, um, actually two more, uh, any thoughts on console or mobile uh, ver uh, versions oh, of Wilderness? I would love to do console someday. We would love to. The problem is that we, um, well, I... <laughs> I did Don't it. bring me into this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I did it in a custom engine. Uh, so it's not going to be a simple matter to port it. Um, but yeah, I think it would be really great on Switch. We'd love to do it. I think it would be a great fit. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd be happy to do other consoles too. But it's just, yeah, it's the question of porting it. Okay. And in terms of pricing, uh, this game is clocking in at $20. Is that That's just... Right. Is that an early access price, or is that uh, something that's going to stick around when it releases in 1.0? We haven't completely decided. Um, I don't know. We're getting some feedback that we should raise our price. It's $20 for now. <laughs> Let's get in there. <laughs> get in there. Yeah, maybe it'll go up later. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, then. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I'd like to thank you both for taking time out of your schedules and joining us to talk about Wildermyth. Yeah, um, thanks for having us. No problem, no problem. Um, I've enjoyed what I've played so far, and 
haven't had the time to play it as much as I want to, but so it goes. Anyway, uh, the game is Wildermyth. It's currently available in early access on Steam and itch.io. It's currently uh, selling at $19.99 USD. Um, be sure to pick it up today. Uh, Petty, play us to the next segment. All right, welcome to the topic of discussion. Um, there's a bit of a coin flip as to what to talk about this week. Um, Stadia won um, mm -hmm. in the sense that it won the more immediate thing to talk about. You know, we'll be, we'll be talking about Pokemon Sword and Shield soon enough. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in case you missed it, and there's a good chance you did, because uh, I can't say that Google Stadia has had the most, um, I don't know, marketing behind it, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. Like, it's actually kind of shocking how little Google is advertising this. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I suppose there's a reason for that, because the Stadia has launched um, as of, what, yesterday? But Something like that. You know, but here's the thing. The Stadia launch is the early access launch. You know, it's actually a soft launch. And boy, is it soft. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, they're soft and then whatever the hell this is. Yeah, it's like even calling this early access is being generous. You know, because, look, we've talked about the Stadia before. I think it's. I think we last talked about Stadia in the summer when they did their last update. Mm -hmm. And I don't think at any point we've not had reservations about this thing. Mm -hmm. As someone who technically has to deal with data caps, I'm like, yeah, no. Oh, God. Yeah, it's like, turns out the data cap problem was what we thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, it's like uh, there was a report today. Um, that basically laid out that if you have a data cap, Google Stadia will indeed eat through it about uh, half a month. You know, and that's being generous. Yes, because it turns out streaming um, AAA titles uh, requires a lot of data. Yeah. Well, uh, and this is without you know, 4K like, support, so good lord when that comes. But that's actually seeming, uh, seemingly a secondary issue to um, a lot of stuff. You know, it, it's like, uh, you know, the... <laughs> like I said, it, so much is on fire right now, it's really hard to, uh, to go, where do you start? That's never a good sign. You know, it, like... The, the, the Stadia, oh God, it, it's like we could start with the missing features. And it's not just, oh, hey, we're in early access. You know, uh, it's like even some of the, you know, some of the biggest advertising was 4K, 60 FPS. <laughs> that didn't um, happen. Also, basically being able to play what a streamer is doing or whatever. Yeah, I'm like, uh, it seems it is dependent on the game, but, you know, it's 1080, 30 FPS in some cases. Uh, I'm like, I haven't heard any fucking 4K because 4K isn't available right now. Or if it is, that's another, that's a feature that's coming soon um, in the sense that it's coming next year. I mean, mm -hmm. <sighs> God. Like, is it... It's a mess. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, you can't, like, and it's not just the high-end stuff. It's not just, you know, the, you know, the graphical fidelity. It's mm -hmm. uh, sound. Like, apparently this thing doesn't support surround sound in, like, web browsers and whatnot. Yeah. You know, the, the biggest thing is just accessing it. Um, you, because... 
here's the thing, you know here's the you know here's part of the insidiousness of the stadia it's not just oh hey you get this thing you connect it you you, you know you can play assassin's creed odyssey in your browser it's mm-hmm. you've got to sign up to a whole bunch of google stuff yeah mm-hmm. and if you don't have a pixel you can't play yet yep they want you to only use their their products for accessing it <laughs> And this is another one of our fucking fears right here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, everybody, everybody's worried because, remember, we're a long way from the don't be evil Google. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, everyone kind of recognizes, yeah, Google is as evil as we thought it was. Mm-hmm. jeez. <sighs> like I said, it's just, it, it's actually kind of exhausting how... How much of a fucking failure this is right now. Mm-hmm. And let that don't even get into the latency, oh god. Like I said, <laughs> it's divisions of failure at this point. Mm-hmm. The business model. What the fuck is this? Yeah. Because, you know, here's the thing. People were saying this was going to be the Netflix of gaming. <laughs> no, that's Game Pass. Or a PlayStation like, Now. Yeah, it, it, it's not this, because this is basically Steam, but even more, you don't own things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they found a way to to improve on that, which is the thing that people wanted to improve upon. <laughs> you know, setting the whole aside, you know, digital games, do you own them or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in the case of Stadia, you know... If Stadia <laughs> shuts down, will you get Steam versions of these games? Or are you, they like, bye, motherfucker. And it's a real concern because, you know, it's Google. Everybody's been fucking worried that, you know, Google's going to shut this down in like two years, which is not an unfounded fear. Indeed. Like, look, if people are, look, right or wrong, if people are passing around that, you know, killed by Google thing time and again in reference to Stadia, Google has a fucking marketing problem. Mm hmm. You know, it's like, I, I, you know, it's like some people have said it's exaggerated and, you know, all that stuff. You know, it's like, yes, because they've never killed off a major, major focus. Mm-hmm. You know, all of my Google Plus circles uh, assure me of that. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I could take credit for that, but I saw that on Twitter today. I'm like, And, you know, it's not without cause. Mm-hmm. Like I said, you know, it, it, just going down the list, uh, you know, going back to the business model, it, you know, you don't subscribe to games, at least not right now. You know, I think that is another thing that's coming, you know, within the next six months, let's say, maybe. You know, right now it's you have to buy the full version of the game. Which is fucking mental because some, you know, these games are clocking in at like fifty, sixty dollars. And that gets into the launch lineup. You know, the launch lineup uh, is mostly old games. You know, Mm -hmm. like a lot has been said about having the fucking Tomb Raider games be a major centerpiece of this thing. Mm -hmm. And you're paying full new price for them. Yeah, it's like, who the fuck is going to pay $60 for, you know, especially like the first Tomb Raider game, which came out like, Six years ago. Now, this has always been a bit of an issue, but it's been less of an issue like now because, you know, digital prices are much more accommodating and, you know, shit goes on sale. Yeah, hell, I could walk down to GameStop and go get the original Tomb Raider for my PS4 for, like, less than 20. Among other things, you know, it's like... (sighs) And, you know, Google wants you to buy this at $60. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, if they gave you all of them for $60, that will be okay. But just one of, but for each, God, no thanks. Yeah. Uh, geez. Uh, I'm like, even the uh, the big selling points here, like, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Destiny, Destiny 2, you know. Like, you were getting full access to Destiny 2. No, you, you didn't have to buy the add-ons. Mm-hmm. So here's the problem with the Stadia versions of games. They're closed off. 
you know, if you want to play Destiny 2 on Stadia, you can only play it with other people on Stadia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, never mind what, what I think even like the PlayStation 4 version of Destiny 2 is cross-platform now. I think so, I but I have... haven't had a chance to test it. Or at the very least, even if it's not cross-platform, you can be assured that Destiny 2 has enough of a base on PlayStation 4 where you're going to encounter people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is a big fucking problem with the Stadia. You know, right. you know it's like, you know, in terms of games that you would buy on Stadia alone, they've only got one game. Um, it's called Guilt. It's from Tequila Words. It seems to be a solid B tier game. You know, um, the kind of game that Sony would release at a launch to make sure it doesn't interfere with uh, heavy hitters. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, you don't have a lot of actual heavy hitters. Um, it's also a question of who this thing is for. Um, this really doesn't seem to be a a platform with an actual base because, you know, they seem to be targeting the hardcore segment, which I suppose makes sense because, you know, tech fiends will buy things just because it's the new thing. Mm-hmm. But that's not a big audience. And the way Google's been promoting this shit has been a, a lot of, you know, what they need to do is they need to... You know, they've been advertising, you know, casual people. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, everything about this thing isn't casual friendly. The prices aren't casual. The setup isn't ca- casual. The, you know, the performance is. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, the actual technology of Stadia works. Not as, you know, not as promised, but, you know, the foundational level is fine um, when you get it all up and running. But you need more than that to sell it to people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's pretty clear that Google didn't know what, uh, what to do with this, which is not a surprise because, you know, even though Google has been hiring, you know, industry people, This doesn't really feel like it was guided by industry people, you know, like people who know what the video game industry is. Oh, Uh, shit. I'm looking at the website. They don't mention anything about requiring a Pixel phone to even activate the service. That's they're going to have fun with lawyers on that one. (laughs) <laughs> that that's probably my internal response yeah there yeah <clears throat> and it's like and keep in mind um what people paid 140 dollars for this 130 you know, somewhere there in go. there yeah uh, you know the founders pack and yeah, it's like, I don't think they got their money's worth. No. No, I don't no. think so. Especially no. Destiny isn't, like, the only thing they have access to unless they want to shell out more money for each game. Yeah, it, it's like, I mean, I suppose the next big selling point there is Red Dead Redemption 2. But, you know, keep in mind, the whole selling point of Stadia is you can play these high-end games without needing expensive computer hardware. Mm. But the people who are going to be buying this, you know, who plop down money for the Founders Edition, they're the people who have the expensive computers, Mm -hmm. you know, who could Mm. actually run Red Dead Redemption 2, um, let's say, decently, because, you know, know, Red Dead Redemption 2's PC version is... You know, one of the most unoptimized uh, unoptimized pieces of shit I've seen in the PC landscape in a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, look, people with really fucking fancy hardware are having problems running this game. That's not a sign of uh, graphical fidelity. That's a sign of unoptimized code. Yeah. But 
really the performance in general isn't better than an Xbox One X. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not really doing better than the consoles. And in some sure, cases, you're rather definitely not doing as well as. Yeah. And sure, your modern day consoles, you know, don't have the plug and play factor that, say, a Genesis did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're still, you buy the box, you put the game in, or you download the game, and, you know, after all the updating, you can play the game. You know, the consoles still have the fucking edge in the terms of ease of use factor. You know, so, you know, how long will uh, Google stick by the Stadia? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, it could be because, dead by the end of next year. Well, I mean, and here, here's another thing. We don't know the, the roadmap. You know, we, we know, like, the general timeline of, you know, next year, like, by next spring, uh, spring a whole... Uh, Stadia is expected to be up to snuff. But we're talking like a six month window mm -hmm. for them to get shit in order. And this negative um, feedback isn't going to help things. Yeah. The yeah. negative feedback is about as bad. They're quote unquote negative latency. <laughs> because, um, you know, the knives are being sharpened. Um, I can hear the pitchforks, pitchforks being picked up in the distance. <laughs> yeah, and that's called xCloud. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I have my reservations about game streaming in general, but I've been paying attention to what Microsoft's been doing. Like, they really do seem to be poised to become the leader of game streaming with the whole X uh, xCloud and Game Pass and all that stuff. You know, they seem to understand what a gaming ecosystem is. Mm -hmm. You know, it does. And let's be honest, for all that people were saying that Google Stadia is not the Netflix of video games, mm -hmm. if they wanted it to be sex successful, maybe it should have been. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because that's what Game Pass is. Game Pass, PlayStation Now, mm -hmm. um, Hell Back in the Day, Game Tap. Yes, like God, I I hate that so few people know what Game Tap is because yeah. Game Tap is what this was just you know in the late two thousands. Also, there was On Live back in the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's like the technology works, but we've known that for a decade. Mm -hmm. you know, <sighs> you know, it, it's like didn't necessarily want want the stadia to be in the position that it is but uh, keep in mind like kind of, i'm trying to remember which video it was but um the stadia was um you remember they had the the power glove et the video uh 2600 video game and the dreamcast in fucking cases mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. come up a lot <laughs> you know not in a good way, because what do these things? What do these three things have in common? Utter and complete failure. Yes, it's not just yeah. you know right or wrong. Because let's not mince words here. The Dreamcast was a good system. Mm -hmm. It's just you know these are three things that are emblematic of failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know Google attached itself to that lineage mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what you call a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah and it's not gonna be fondly remembered like dreamcast was <laughs> if it's remembered at all at this point indeed <laughs> like like i said i i don't know how much of a failure how big of an impact the failure is going to have if it's going to remain a failure even because you know, it's like, maybe Google will turn it around. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's the thing. This, you know, the story of Stadia is, you know, chapter one, chapter two. You know, it's like the first few chapters have been really big stumbles. But I think, you know, it's like um, getting back to one of the other biggest problems 
that the Stadia faces is actual games. Like, right now, Google is relying on a lot of third-party, um, you know, entities. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, setting aside, you know, the old stuff. You know, you can get Destiny 2 elsewhere. You can... You can get Red Dead Redemption 2 elsewhere. Yeah, if you just mm-hmm. want to play Destiny 2, not have the expansions, it's free to play on everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The point of order is most of these things can be found on other... Stuff like that. You're in the, the other platforms. Yeah. You know, it's like, what are you, you know, what are you going to play on Stadia itself? Like, th- there's a big reason why, unless you're, say, iOS, and even then... You know, why you need exclusive content, why, you know, going over to like the streaming platforms, you know, all of them have exclusive content coming to it because, you know, that's the software that sells your hardware. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm like, the best I've seen is, you know, like Grid is going to have an exclusive mode to Stadia where like you can have 40 racers I'm assuming like high de- detail or something, mm-hmm. and you know there's also the promise that uh, you know Stadia, the cloud gaming, all that stuff is going to unleash new, unique, creative um, endeavors um, mm-hmm. that you can't replicate in other spaces. I mean that may be true, but who knows how long that's going to be? You know, it's like. You know, it's like Google has very little in the way of actual infrastructure to develop and publish games. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they are delivering one game at launch. It's like, what else are they bringing to the fucking Stadia? You know, the answer to that is, uh, like, the only other Stadia game I can think of right now is um, Orcs Must Die 3. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, and this is one of their biggest problems because whatever else I can guarantee you that Sony and Microsoft, they're going to have a lot of exclusive content to their fucking ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Because they've, you know, they've not only only got that in place, they've been buying companies up to have that shit in place. I mean, Microsoft has been buying companies left and right just to ha- make sure they have the game presence needed to sell their fucking ecosystem. Sony's doing this as well. Now, what the fuck is Google doing? Mm-hmm. You know, they're just, they, they got to build it all. And, you know, I don't think time is on their side on this. So, so, you you know, the overall um, state of Stadia right now is a burning dumpster of a launch that not a lot of people are noticing, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, and let's, you know, that right there is another sign of trouble. Like, where's the fucking hype? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it's like people are not fucking talking about Stadia, and I, you know, unless they're talking about the launch or you know, or you know, people in the industry like us. Like, where 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 is the fucking advertising, and not just you know, like on YouTube? You know, where are the fucking television ads, the sports arena ads? You know, the the get this shit out to the people kind of ads. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I suppose that's another uh, feature that's coming in 2020. <laughs> but once like, again, you'd that figure doesn't... they'd at least bring ads for this stuff on, like, Cartoon Network or, you know, Disney, Nickelodeon, stuff like that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's like, you know, where are, you know, where are the ads? You know, because mm-hmm. I know people begrudge advertising and marketing, but you know what? You need those to get your product out there. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, I know this is Google and everything, but you can only grassroots so far. 
yeah, it's like it's Google. They have the fucking resources to do this mm -hmm. if they want to. But you know, they're approaching this platform in a very Googleish way that you know doesn't work out a good amount of the times. You know. Ask anyone who used the Google Wave how that worked out. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Hmm. Look, we could ju we could spend twenty minutes talking about the things Google has killed. Mm -hmm. you now. So, yeah, we'll um, we'll see where Stadia lands in the spring, I guess. Indeed. Yeah. So anyway. That'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Um, just a programming note. Uh, we will not be having a show next week on Wednesday because Thanksgiving. You know, we we do take the you know the two major holidays off because you know plans and stuff. Uh, also, you know, trying to get guests for that uh, headache and a half. So. Um, anyway, we are still doing the review sessions, um, and coming up on this, uh, and no Friday show uh, as well. Um, anyway, coming up on the November 24th, uh, review session, we'll be having Ping Redux, Super Boxland D-Make for Nintendo Switch, and Heroes of Shaloa. I think that's how that's pronounced. Um, and on the December 1st edition of the Fragments of Silicon Reviews, we will be having reviews of Sparklight, War Room, and Deep Space Rush. So until next time, I shall wish you good games.